Pannenberg's whole theological project is oriented with a, really the summary of an ontological priority of the future. Now, what does that mean? That means for most of us, for almost all of us, in, in human wisdom and understanding, we have an ontological priority of the past or the present. You are, an ont ontology is a way of saying you're being, you're, you're, it's, it's a, what makes us us, what our core, there's a lot of different directions, but it's really a way of saying uh, the study of our being. Um, so what, what makes us truly us? Well, it's our past. Right? And maybe not just our own personal past, it's the past generations, our history. And so th that whole narrative that feeds into then what makes me present here, it gives me definition, but not just that. We have, some people can say, well, the past doesn't matter. What matters is who you choose to become now. So we have an ontological priority of the future. And that's not quite as common in, in practice because we really see ourselves and see others as part of this whole package of history of journey, of genetics. Genetics is really a, uh, a kind of biological history of, of someone's journey from the past to the present and all these stories. If you've done a genealogy, that this, you have this huge family tree of why I am here now speaking this language, looking like I do and all the rest may not have been always my choices, but which so many other stories fed into that. Now, I, am I fully committed to just being part of that journey without choice? Well, there's a lot of question, but still we say what makes us us is most strongly determined by the past or partially the present. Pannenberg flips this around. Pannenberg argues, along with Moltmann, that rather than being defined by our past or past histories or the past reality or the present, that what we are really defined by is the work of Jesus Christ. Now, the work of Jesus Christ, we can say, well, that happened in the past. We have the Gospels, right? Or we have God's work in the Old Testament. But that's not the completed work of Christ, not the completed work of the triune God. What we say is the completed, fully revealed revelation of God is something that happens in what we call the future. So even though that hasn't happened yet in our experience of time and space, it is still so true because God is truly God and God doesn't exist in our time frame. God's promise is trustworthy beyond anything else. And so what happens in our experience of the future, what God is doing in what we call the end times actually gives us definition. So who God is in eternity reaches back into our experience of time. So the, what we would see as the future, God's fulfilled promise, reaches back to give us meaning in our present. And that meaning that we have in the present then redeems and reorients how we understand the past. So it's not the past that gives me meaning and definition and I'm stuck with this. It's just the opposite. When we enter into communion with Christ, our ontology becomes that of the future our future. It's not God's future. God exists outside of this. But instead of being defined by what we've done or what so many other people have done, we're defined by who God is and what God is doing. The fulfilled revelation of God in eschatology is the definitive statement of both God and humanity. It's a lot of stuff to deal with there. Uh, so I said it very, very quickly, but hopefully with the readings and other things, you'll have more time and I'm always happy to answer any questions. But what this means too is the topic of eschatology is, is much more than what happens at the supposed end times. It, if we talk about in, an ontology of the future, as Pannenberg does, that the end times is the beginning of our discussion. We say God is doing and will be fulfilled in this revelation. And that reaching back then enters into where I'm going, who I am, what I've been, and then that interacts with all the other discussions of theology. So eschatology then becomes the central orienting element of all of Christian theology. For Pannenberg, eschatology gives meaning to all of reality, future and present and past. So what does this mean about God? Well, God doesn't say, oh, you know what? I don't know what he's going to do. Or God doesn't say, well, he, he's committed to this story because of what his ancestors did. 
No, God observes the course of history from the perspective of the future. Our pers- what we would see as the future, we would say God is observing us from there, and so he already knows. In reaching towards us from the future gives us a revelation of his fullness. So who is God? God doesn't reveal simply what God has done in the past. God reveals who God is, who God was, and who God will be. God in the future is the definitive expression of God's fullness, and that revelation comes back to us, giving us an understanding. So we get a revelation of his fullness. We get a foretaste of the essence of heaven. So then where do we see pneumatology fit in this? I'm going to jump off the slide a little bit. If the Spirit is God, and that's what we say, then the Spirit's engagement with us is one from the future. The Spirit is orienting us towards the future. Because that is where the Spirit is. That is where we're drawn to. So when we experience the fullness of the Spirit, we're getting a taste of this eternal beyondness that is not just limited to our past or present, in which the fullness of God's revelation is hidden in the present, we begin to experience even now. So this revelation, this fullness, this security of the future, the idea, the promise that God is indeed God, which we're still admittedly suspect about. And I know you're not supposed to say that, and I know that's, that's not something we're, we'd admit at our churches, but the truth is, and this is where sin and doubt and frustration and all this comes from, we're a little suspicious about whether God is truly God. We're like the Israelites in the wilderness. God, you saved us from that, that thing back there, but right now we're really thirsty. Are you gonna? And so we struggle with that. We're really, we, even those of us who have faith, we're like, God, I believe, but help my unbelief because we're caught in this trap. So what the eschatology does is the security of God's presence, is God God, gives us a foundation on which to base all that uncertainty and questioning and the rest. We say, if God is truly God, then all these things are already done. God is already one. And in light of that, I can live this life in a new way. I can live this life with hope, even if the world around me is crumbling. That's not Nuna Pannenberg. Read the book of Acts. Read the letters of Paul. Read the early church writings. That was a definitive understanding of their priorities in which they lived within the world, but with a hope that didn't come from the world. They didn't find their being and meaning derived from the Roman Empire or the religious leaders or all the rest. They found their being their meaning derived from the hope and promise that God gives to humanity through the work of Christ and the power of the Spirit. It is this pervasive quality of eschatological hope that gave Pannenberg, along with Moltmann, the moniker, the theologians of hope. Moltmann tends to get this a lot more because he'd spent a lot more time developing and focusing on this while Pannenberg added different pieces in different directions. But it's still central to the whole theological project of Pannenberg that hope, this ontology of the future in which God's reality is absolute and trustworthy, that defines everything. However, as hope, this is where hope is this is this kind of this squishy word sometimes. Sometimes, like, I hope I'm going to do this tomorrow, or I hope this, you know, nice thing happens. It can be something from, like, a, a really confident hope, like, I hope um, it's going to stay sunny the rest of the day, which is a hope because it was <laughs> uh, kind of weathery the last few days. Uh, well, that's kind of confident because I've, I've looked at the weather reports or rather than I hope I win the lottery. Well, that's a really, really, really challenging hope, especially since I don't play the lottery. So that would, like I can hope that, but eh. so hope kind of has this carries a lot of meaning. So when, but when Pannenberg and Moltmann say hope, this is not in terms of our vague, squishy, oh, I'd like this to be true. This is hope in terms of hope love, joy, fruit of the spirit kind of stuff where hope is a substantive promise that is not yet experienced, but is something we can bet our whole reality on. So it's important to develop Pannenberg's eschatology more specifically to develop what does he mean by hope in our context? Well, what hope isn't this squishy reality. Hope isn't this this thing like that we just kind of have this vague, oh, I hope God works things out, but I'm just going to keep hedging my bets in other ways. No, hope transforms how we live because if the hope is something that is substantive that we can depend on we live in a entirely different way that's oriented 
in who God calls us to be. If we have to hedge our bets, if the hopes isn't trustworthy, then we have to live according to the systems of the world. We have to develop our security. We have to do all these other things. We have to be very egocentric. We have to be self-protective. We can have a community, but we, we, we don't let people too far in because what if they hurt us? God's hope does something different than that. Going back to how we uh, d distinguish between the Pannenberg and Moltmann's eschatology and the, the broader way it's been discussed as, as we've done throughout these uh, discussions. Often in popular context, the issue of eschatology is limited to the question of Christ's return, like when's Christ Jesus coming back? Who gets to go to heaven? So we tend to narrow it to a, a, a relatively narrow set of topics that really have to do with our own curiosity or just our own selfishness. Like, I want to go to heaven. So who gets to go? And we like to judge. We like to categorize. We like to know when to put things on our schedule, what to plan for, how long, or if there's going to be a waiting period. What, so, so we have one judgment. Is there a final judgment? I die. What happens then? What will happen according to the predicted science or wonders? We make this into a puzzle or a set of clues, and we want to figure it out because that's what humans do. We like to figure it out based on past, present, future. We, we are linear and analytical. So we tr everything we do tries to get as many pieces of the puzzle as we can in order to anticipate what's going to happen farther along in light of w the trajectory. But if the trajectory is coming from a different direction, that makes it a lot less uh, the focus. So what this happens when you do that, it separates eschatology into its own isolated sphere of discussion, isolated as a predicted moment of prophecy that has little integration with the rest of theology. You could really cut most eschatology out of almost everyone's theology, and it really wouldn't have a big difference. We would just say, you could, so many of us could have this Christianity where we say, yes, you just believe in Jesus, you go to heaven don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell, or everyone goes to heaven. That could be people's entire eschatology. And in fact, it really is if, if it comes down to it, except in my experience for the people who get obsessed about end times and millennial stuff, most people have this very squishy kind of vague, um, something's going to happen. It, it's all going to pan out in the end, right? Well, that's not how the Bible uses eschatology, and Pannenberg brings this back in. But this way, this anemic picture of Christ's return echoes back into so much evangelical thought and then creates a kind of doctrines across the board that reflect this underlying emptiness, even say. It orients the Christian life about getting into heaven. It orients the Christian life around being among the chosen ones who get their ticket and contrast the ones who are getting tossed into hell. It makes the Christian life kind of like an elitist country club. Are they going? Who gets in? I don't want that person in. How do they get in? I hope I get in because I have a you know I want to tee off at ten, right? There's this also this very narrow dualistic percep perception of God's work that tries to figure out what does it mean to get on the right team? How do we get to sit at God's lunch table? And is that really ultimately what the Christian life is about? Getting into the right country club, getting into the right membership. And then once you get in, your job is to get other the right people in and convince them because it's really great. But is that really what it's about? That's the question, right? That's the question of not only our theology, that's, that's the question of, is that what scripture tells us? And I keep coming back to this question because when you veer going into a certain direction of eschatology that's different from the standard models that uh, much of our churches focuses on, people will accuse you of leaving scripture. And especially if you're using these fine driven theologians that nobody's ever heard of called Wolfhart Pannenberg and Jürgen Moltmann, everyone's suspect. But if we actually say, well, read your Bible, what does the Bible orient us towards in light of God's promise? And is that what our church ministries and evangelism is reflecting? Or is it reflecting a different kind of eschatology that uses verses in part, but really leaves the end times and eschatology in a so shallow position that people really ignore it?
or obsess about a lot of details that the Bible itself oddly says don't obsess about. But as Pannenberg's whole theology is about a coherent theology oriented around God's complete indirect revelation, and indirect means, this is going back to his whole methodology, he says God primarily reveals himself in an indirect way. If you go back to our discussion of history, you, you, you saw how he, he used this, that God doesn't say, he sometimes does, like with Moses, like, here's the law, here I am, here's my autobiography. He says, look at what I'm doing. Here's a prophet. Here's how I'm working in this way. And we, we get to know God by his works, by how he shapes and directs things, not as much through the direct conversation. So, as, But we have a testimony of this indirect revelation through scripture that's so thorough, it gives us a pretty strong picture of who God is when we limit the full expression of God's revelation to either a later moment down the road where God finally talks about himself or limits the idea of salvation to just being on the right team or just getting into the right country club, that really misses the point. It's missing the point of how God showed himself and in the people of Israel, before the people of Israel, onward into the New Testament, what is God's mission and purpose? Eschatology is this summary complete experience of that. God it doesn't just care about getting people on the right team, which is why again and again, he chose when he chose the people of Israel, he didn't say, all right, you're in, now you're good. We had the prophets. He had so many others say, I've given you this law, and it comes with this whole package of expectations, which isn't about work salvation to live up to. It's about living into the promise, living into the call, the covenant that God has given us. So Pannenberg's insistence on a coherent theology means that eschatology is not a separate topic because it doesn't become a separate topic in Scripture. And Pannenberg is bringing theology back to an awareness of how eschatology needs to have have this coherence and all of theology needs to have a coherence if it is truly to be reflective of who God is, what God is doing, and what God wants of us. So it's in, for him, it's inherently integrated within the whole of his Trinitarian proposals. It's intimately related to his overall anthropology and with its topics of sin and salvation. So all of these things become eschatologically oriented. So much so that after reading a lot of Pannenberg, you can say eschatological without stumbling over all the syllables. You get a lot of practice saying eschatological. So with Pannenberg, we have to understand when we talk about eschatology, we're not often getting to the topics that are usually discussed in end times and churches. And this again is where eschatology and academic discussions is almost unrecognizable compared to church discussions. I would be very careful to categorizing either one as being more biblical because they're just really latching onto different expressions. Though I would argue that Pannenberg's approach is actually more holistically biblical. But it's talking about different things because it's drawing together a coherent discussion that the rest of eschatological thought tends to ignore. But Pannenberg, unlike Moltmann, also tends to ignore the, the common discussions of millennium and other things that are so popular, especially in the United States uh, and in, in some more conservative theologies where they get obsessed about Revelation and, and uh, Daniel and all the rest. He tends to ignore that. Moltmann tends to have a much more... Uh, pastoral understanding of connecting where people are and where they come and, and linking them. Well, Pannenberg is much more interested in developing his own uh, coherent project of uh, theological integration. So when we talk of, then about eschatology, we have to under, not just say, well, let's go back to the end. We have to say, well, who is God? Because God then is fully revealed in this eternal perspective. God reveals himself as self-differentiating expressions, a trinity of persons united in a single essence that is eternally expressed through reciprocity and openness to each other. Now, I know this is in the class on the Trinity, but what that statement is, is a very succinct statement of Trinitarian relationship that's not hierarchical, but that is an expressiveness of how God is both one and community. 
So there's a social Trinitarian understanding, if you understand that lingo, that then defines how God expresses within God's own self and also in God's creation and whole orientation. And then this becomes the expression of what the Spirit does because this is who the Spirit is. This is identity. God's self is the source and foundation of all reality. God's being gives meaning and all things to all people. Without God's being, nothing would exist. So God's being is the center and source of everything else. If we disconnect from this being, we lose all orienting identity. We can try to put that in something else, but nothing else can sustain our identities. Nothing else can sustain our true being except for God, because only God is eternal. And God is exocentric. What does that mean? Creating the world in ecstatic, excited relationality, enabling other created identities to be formed with this shared goal of exocentric unity. Exocentric means outward oriented. I'm not trying to make everything orient towards myself. I'm not trying to make sure the world revolves around me, that my will is done for my own sake. And so God, in God's fullness, in God's Trinitarian reciprocity, never makes one person, like everyone's oriented toward the Father, everyone's oriented toward the Son, or or all three oriented to the Spirit. No, they're all three oriented towards each other in this eternal dance, we can say, of mutuality and reciprocity in which no one is exhausted and no one's overwhelmed, but they're all giving and receiving an eternal relationship. And then that exocentricity where we God gives, the Father gives to the Son, knowing that the Son is going to be faithful and give in return, that the Spirit is going to be filling so that you're, as much as they give, they're also receiving without worry, without distrust. That then too is the vision of all that God created. All other created identities that find their meaning and being in God are likewise called into this experience of exocentric unity. We're called to be one by a mutuality in which we are all looking out for each other and helping each other thrive. Now, that can sound codependent in a lot of our own uh, current psychological problems where a lot of our help or work with other people really is about us feeling good about ourselves. We, we, we can be selfish while helping people in our own psychological sense, and it's not that at all. What it is is freedom. We can be free to interact and provide and help and encourage each other because we don't have to protect our back from being broken because we're being filled. As much as we give, we are being filled. And ultimately that filling comes from God, that comes from the Holy Spirit. That filling that is always trustworthy is one in which Christ himself engaged with and offers to us, invites us into. We can trust Jesus. And in trusting Jesus, that orients and gives relative perspective to every other relationship we had. Someone else can disappoint us, but we can trust that Jesus gives us sustained meaning and being. We can trust that the Holy Spirit is empowering us, so we don't have to look to the powers of the world to give us meaning. Now, what if churches actually did that? What if every Christian actually did that? But that's the promise of eschatology, that that's not a risk, that's a fulfilled reality. Because relationality the idea that to be in relationship is not the same as being working for someone or being enslaved, we have we are also given this freedom of identity, this choice of interactions. We can't be fully trusting of each other if we're compelling each other so that once that is broken, then we can go off and do our own thing. If my job stops paying me, I like you all, but if my job stops paying me, I'll, I stop t- teaching here, right? Because we we do things based on other stuff. But if I know that if Fuller stopped paying me or whoever stopped paying me, that I'm sustained and all my needs are taken care of, I would do this because I enjoy do the, doing this and this is part of my calling. So when where then do I base my sense of self and purpose? Not on Fuller's always flexible relationship based on finances and vision and all the rest, but I base my teaching on the calling. But that's a risk, right? It's a risk for me. It's a risk for my family. That's a risk for everyone. So everyone engages this kind of risk. And like with Adam and Eve in the garden, the serpent said, why don't you eat that fruit? He said, well, God told us not to. And he said, he's afraid of you. 
they realized there was this risk, this risk of disobeying God that the serpent promised something better, but in promising something better, cut them off from the source of life itself. And so God allowed the tree for the sake of allowing the kind of risk that makes relationality truly free. Free identities can choose to establish their meaning in alternative source of, of identity. And no other source of identity can give us ultimate eternal value or meaning, but they promise a lot. They promise a lot more immediateness. They promise to tap into parts of ourselves that we think have to be satisfied or and that God doesn't want for us. So, but even if we do this, as God is the only source of sustainable identity, putting our identity in anything else other than God, that could be family, that could be work, that could be sexuality, that could be food, that could be go down the list of everything that we identify with or identify as this is who I am. When we say I am this, that's an ontological statement. God says I am in himself. If we are truly going to be sustained in eternity, we have to participate with that I am. I am in Christ. And everything else becomes relative. Because everything else results in corruption and death. It can't sustain anything beyond a present experience of this reality. It can't live up to the promises. No matter what culture or other people say. Put your identity in this church even. A lot of them think it can be good things. But they can't sustain you. And so we have to be careful to always orient in Christ. So these attempts to derive meaning from an alternative insufficient source is called sin. Now, we, can ha we have our list of, of sins and here are the naughty things you do, here are the good things you do. That's not really how sin should be discussed because sin is anything else that becomes our sense of identity. It could be food. When food becomes our identity, we call that gluttony. We can go down the list. All the things that God made us to be fulfilled have their good, have their work and role if they're used in light of our relative experience within Christ. They find meaning and purpose and fluidity in Christ, outside, separated, made to be the only thing about us. They can't give us life. So the work of Christ is the foundation upon which a fallen humanity can be renewed in the identity of God. The humanity isn't trustworthy. We're not trustworthy people, but tr but in Christ, become trustworthy in the light of Christ's obedience on the cross. We enter into this relationship. God's promised fulfillment then reaches back to us from the future, gives us an orientation in this new kind of life. And in Christ, we have a trustworthiness because of his grace and the power of the Spirit. Even as we still struggle being in this already but not yet experience in which we're caught between these two narratives. The past still tries to compel us. The past still tries to find us. The present realities around us still, still try to co-opt us. But as in as much as we orient ourselves in God's true eternal future, the ultimate truth, the actually only real source of being, in as much as we do that, we find a new kind of way of interrelating to each other and to ourselves. In this trust, people become restored to a fullness in the power of the Spirit who recreates fallen identities back into sustainable, life-oriented identities that, in which God resonates all throughout in this experience of relational freedom and enlivening that isn't limited to just certain religious acts but becomes just about who we are wherever we are. So as God is the infinite essence of self-differentiated reciprocity, remember go back to our discussion in the Trinity, that's, those are really big words, but remember where they're oriented. God is three in one, self-differentiated -differ persons, all in this eternal relationship of reciprocity. Eternally exocentric itself, the Father is always pointing to the Son, the Son's others pointing to the Spirit, the Spirit's always pointing to the Father, the Spirit's always pointing to the Son. They're all pointing to each other. They're all saying, look this direction. The revelation of this reality then in our own experiences progresses according to God's own self-revelation in history. Whew! That's a big paragraph. And I'm saying it quickly, but this brings really together what so much of this class has been about. What does it mean to be truly exocentric, oriented in the light of God's being and identity? Humans are learning this. We are learning more and more about what this means. 
God reveals more and more, and so this revelation of God becomes this increasing package of awareness and calling and challenge that is driving us from the future into being a new kind of people in the present. The ontological priority of the future means that we're not simply awaiting this transformation later on. If we're waiting this transformation later on, that means the, the past is orienting the present, which means we're waiting for the future. It's just the opposite. The future is waiting for us to embrace it and reverse our ontological identity. We're not awaiting a transformation of identity at a later point. We're, we're called to live into this new identity that was already been enacted in the full work of God. As we enter into this trust relationship with God, our being even now, our self, all that makes us us is being defined in this new way. And so we're being transformed. We're being transformed into the identities for which God created us. We're being born again. Now that has become such a trite and overused phrase in a lot of ways of like, yes, this is the moment I became a, a Christian. I was born again. And we talk about kind of this package of a born and created Christian. But there's a really depth of meaning, which is why Nicodemus said, well, how do you do that? Because when you're born again, it's not just a uh, end point of, the, of like, oh, now I'm finally in this club. No, we're rebooted. It's like a do-over in a video game where it's like restart. And rather than all this bad path we, went, we wished to go down before, we're invited into living into a new kind of psychology, a new kind of sociology, a new kind of relational reality, a new understanding of work, of being, of calling, of emotions, of actions, of thought. All these things become rebooted in light of the fact we've been given a new understanding of what reality is that is shaped by who God is ahead of us. This eschatological work that reaches back into the future, gives us meaning so that we live in a new way, we interpret the past in a new way, which involves a lot of things, but above all, maybe not above all, but certainly in, strongly including a reality of forgiveness. We forgive those who sinned against us. We forgive rather than we hold on to uh, anger. We forgive rather than we hold on to rage or hold, because those things, if, if as, in as much as we're holding on to those things, and they're often things that are very bad and things that, are, that, that aren't innocent and very real, I'm not dismissing that. I'm, just, I'm not minimizing those bad things. I'm maximizing this new definition of God. But in as much as we hold on to those things, we def, we're being given meaning by the past. Those we don't forgive hold on to our being. They're shaping us. They're holding on to us. They're still grasping on us. And that, that, that makes sins against us even worse because it reshapes who we are. But in the work of Christ, we can forgive. And in forgiveness, we can enter into a new kind of reconciliation in the power of the Spirit, which takes an activity. That's a, that's a, that's a social experience of the, the oppressor and the oppressed finding this re renewal being given hope in different ways and transformation in different ways. So reconciliation isn't just up to us, but we become oriented that. We are becoming who we were made to be in light of the God who was and is and is to come. We are becoming who we are eternally, even in our present, that then reshapes what we are concerned about in our past. Whew. Because God is at essence relational, this transformation does not and cannot mean an isolated salvation that enables us to be saved as an individual in contrast to others. Because that's not how God views reality. It's not just about us. It's about us in participation with the fullness of God's work and becoming this new kind of people. Instead, this, this salvation, this transformation by definition insists on a mutuality, insists on a participation with others, forming us into trust-oriented relationships, become open participants with others in relationships of trust and exocentric identity. That word exocentric is we're oriented towards others because we find our fullness in Christ. We're not manipulated. We're not uh, undermined. We're not codependent. But we're oriented to see, help see others thrive in as much as we're thriving in the experience of Christ. We become open to each other because we are increasingly given our definition by God and God's identity. And where is God's identity? Eternity. God's fullness. 
where is God fullness temporally for us, the future, but also wraps around us. It's very mind boggling. But what that means for us is very practical. We don't have to live egocentric, isolated, defensive lives, defining ourselves in contrast or in defensiveness from others. We don't have to expect others to give us meaning. We don't have to expect institutions to give us meaning. We are free to love. We are free to hope. We are free to help. We are to free to live in the fullest way possible, oriented in God's purpose and presence with redeemed humanity. And this freedom isn't isolated freedom. This freedom isn't, okay, now I can go off and do my own thing. This actually is an engaged kind of freedom because like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, right? This expression of let freedom ring really reflects this kind of understanding. Because we have this freedom, we can live in a new way that is contrast to the oppressive structures of society and help others find this new kind of freedom as well. We live in a liberated and liberating way. That also, though, isn't defined by politics or all these other systems that say, well, if you want to get something done, you have to do it this way. No. It may or may not use those, and there's overlap. But all those structures are also trying to give everyone meaning. We, so, so much of church life and so much of social life these days is defined by who you are politically. Politics is taking a kind of divine role in all of our eschatological hopes. You, everything that has to be done has to be done through politics. Who, who, who did you vote for? Well, that's who you are. We define this whole package. Politics can never live up to its promises. Politics is part of our social life, but we have to engage our social life in light of God's work and God's meaning, which means not being identified within those political names but identified with God, which means our identity isn't categorized in the same way. We don't sign on to the whole package and give in to the lies and distortions and all the rest that all politics tends to do. We find our meaning in Christ, and like Jesus answered people who kept asking him questions, he, he was very, very uh, slippery in some ways. People would try to nail him down on certain topics and align himself with certain groups, and he wouldn't do it, but he also didn't dismiss the real needs of humanity. He engaged people, but in a way that reflected the reality of the kingdom and the identity as in fullness of being God. And that is our calling as well. All this, being free to love, free to hope, free to help, free to live, free to free others, free to experience the fullness of freedom in a way that people who just get to do whatever they want whenever they want can't even imagine because those people are almost always enslaved to something, enslaved to sexuality, enslaved to alcohol, enslaved to legalism, enslaved to this or enslaved to that. That's why money doesn't, because, doesn't uh, uh, fulfill its promises because people just get enslaved by this or that. In being in Christ, we become oriented in a new way because we are actually free in ourself. And in being free in ourself, we can live in a new kind of openness to others that aren't looking to others to give us meaning or give us respect or to satisfy our will as if we're little gods and, and want everyone to cater towards us. No, we're free to free others. We're free to see others empowered. We're free to see others thrive and in their thriving, they help us thrive. It's a spiral of thriving that begins even now and extends into the fullness of eternity because this is God's own presence and promise with us. <laughs> <laughs>